Hello again and welcome to the Ultimate Wedding Photography Summit. Our next focus for the day is going to be on the subject of lighting. Specifically, we're going to be talking about three simple steps to using off-camera flash with Zach and Jody Gray. My name is Jared Bauman. I'm the president here at Shoot.edit. And I'm also joined by Caitlin Cooper, our marketing coordinator. I'll be your host. I'll be turning it over to Zach and Jody, though, in just a minute to get going in the presentation. Uh, just a reminder, make sure to join us as soon as the presentation is over for a live Q&A with Zach, Jody, Caitlin, and myself. And that's where we're going to be able to get all your questions answered that you're asking throughout the presentation. So make sure to use the chat feature that you see on the screen right in front of you. So first off, for those of you that are new to Shoot.edit, let me take a second and tell you a little bit about us. We're the first choice post-processing partner for the Wedding Pro and everything that they shoot. We make your images look consistent based on your personal style. Fast is best and no one is faster. We provide turnaround time as fast as 48 hours. So today, the Ultimate Wedding Photography Summit, uh, it was made possible by such a great collection of different companies. Uh, this this a is a really big event and we couldn't have done it without their support. So I wanna take a minute and highlight a few of them before we jump into Zach and Jody's presentation. Uh, we have Song Freedom and Song Freedom provides licensed music for musicians, photographers, and cinematographers. They provide a place where photographers and cinematographers can come to find the perfect song for their story with the click of a button. They represent artists who share a vision for and commitment to creating visual stories in a hungry world for large video footprint. And we also have SLR Lounge. SLR SLR Lounge is a free online resource created by photographers for photographers. They provide photography tutorials, Lightroom tutorials, photography news, and more for professional photographers. Yeah, really couldn't uh, agree more with the, the thankfulness for all the support we've had. Two great companies there. So many of them came together to make this, uh, this all-day uh, Wedding Photography Summit possible. So a little background on Zach and Jody, and then we'll, we'll get going. Uh, Zach and Jody received recognition for their work. They were named as one of Nashville's top wedding photographers in 2009, one of Westcott's top endorsed pros. They're members of the exclusive SanDisk Extreme team. They've been published in leading publications such as People Magazine, Rangefinder, Southern Weddings. Uh, they've also been able to personally instruct over 1,200 photographers through their in-camera workshops. They're going to be sharing with you guys uh, a lot of different value today, specifically on off-camera lighting. And I'm going to go ahead and get started by turning it over to them. Just a reminder, uh, before I hand it over, use that chat feature to ask your questions. And then we will go live afterwards after the presentation is over for Q&A with uh, Zach and Jody. All right, guys, take it away. All right, awesome. So Jody and I are extremely passionate about off-camera lighting and creating great light. And the exciting thing about this is this, it's not as complicated as you think it is, and we're going to talk about the three simple steps that we use to get amazing off-camera flash. And when you decide to start adding off-camera flash to your toolkit, like Jared said earlier, it not only opens up a new world of possibilities of things that you can do, um, which we're going to show you here in a second, but also it allows you to do things when you're in those tricky situations, when you get in to a reception and they're leaving and it's pitch black outside and there's no light and they're deciding to blow bubbles and you're like, what in the world are they doing? But it allows you to capture and create those great moments for your clients. Or, you know, you oftentimes can see beautiful sunsets and you want to capture your couple with the sunset, but they end up just being completely black. So having that light is great because then you can capture your subject beautifully as well as that sunset. You can also create really cool stylistic engagement and portrait session shots and not just beautiful natural light ones, which don't get us wrong, Jody and I love natural light. Yeah. We are big fans of natural light and we use it whenever we can, but we can also create something different and something dramatic. What's also really exciting too is we can take a location that's boring but has maybe an interesting background like you see here and we can turn it into a stunning portrait. The image there on the left is just the natural light but then that image there you see on the right, that's that off-camera flash doing something really beautiful and dynamic. It's also fun to bust out some off-camera light and make the guys look even cooler. They eat that up. Yeah, when the guys look masculine and steadily because we know how to use this flash, they get really excited. And all of a sudden, they want us to actually take pictures of them. It's cool, too, because you can also take candid lit moments. Believe it or not, even though strobes and off-camera flash and speed light sometimes feel a little sta static, you can take some really incredible images of that as well. 
And it's also really cool to have some light tricks in your pocket for situations like this. This is outside, it's pitch black. How in the world can we get this cool shot of all the groomsmen smoking and capture this moment? So even with no ambient light, we can do it. And maybe some of you photographers out there, you shoot in the studio and you want to be able to take one or two lights even. Whoa, two lights, watch out. And create some really beautiful, dramatic portraits. You can do those kind of things. What's exciting too in the studio or on location is you can shoot highly stylized stuff and believe it or not everything that you're looking at in this picture was all shot in the camera using a myriad of lighting effects and tricks that are actually very simple to do. What's really exciting too is you can shoot unique portraits, stuff that you wouldn't normally see, stuff that you really cannot do with natural light can be done. Uh, the other exciting thing too is you can create something very eye-catching using more than one light. Now this is you know, later on, as we'll start learning this kind of stuff, once we master using one light, we can start adding multiple lights and create all kinds of really beautiful and powerful effects. So now that you've kind of got your appetite whetted, you've seen some cool photos, and hopefully you guys are getting excited, now we can get into the system, the keys. What are we going to do to be able to, to, to create this kind of light? So the very first key is actually having the right kind of light. What is the right light for you and what you're wanting to accomplish? And you really need to, this isn't a, a question that Jody and I can answer, we can show you some options. But what we mean here by the right kind of light is what is your style of shooting? What kind of way do you shoot? What kind of clients do you shoot? So there's really two sort of broad options and one of them is to use off-camera strobes. So strobes are sort of these more powerful off-camera lights, they can darken the Sun, they tend to be a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier. Luckily, with great technology for you wedding and portrait photographers, this is a, a system that we use for a long time. It's called the Ranger Quadra, and it only weighs about five pounds in total, and you can actually it's powerful enough that you can darken the sky in the middle of the day with it. So it's about eight to ten times more powerful than a speed light or a SB900 or a, a Canon speed light. So this is one option and you have to decide, one, weighing the cost analysis. Is this the kind of thing that I want? And is this the kind of tool that I need? Do I need to manipulate all kinds of light or do I just need to shoot maybe a dark reception hall? So the great thing about this light is it has a lot of power and you can overpower the sun and get those really blue skies and that's why this light is really great. And there are also lighting setups like this that have a ton of power but they are half the price. So if you go to our gear list you can see links to all of that so yeah. we'll talk about those as well. Yeah, take a look at that link right there. It's just bit.ly slash ZJ gear list and on there we have different options like Jody said. Stuff that literally costs half as much as this but does pretty much the exact same thing. So once you figure out the base light, and we're going to talk about more coming up, then there's what we call the modifiers, because even though this is a really great powerful light, it's still a small little flash, and we'll get into more of that later about what that means, but we like to get some sort of modifier on the front that's going to help us to shape, and modifiers basically shape the light. Most of the time Jody and I have used, and most of the photos that you've ever seen from us um, all over our website and in workshops and seminars and all that stuff was taken using this softbox right here, which is the Westcott 24 by 32 softbox. So we're going to show you right here exactly what that thing can do. So here's a photo from a number of years back. My amazing wife Jody is here shooting um, some beautiful natural light as you can see, but what happens is when you expose to that beautiful natural light, even at the end of the day, look at the sky there. You notice the sky turns really white or sometimes it gets completely washed out. But when we know how to use the off-camera light and we have the right type of light for the, the lighting that we're doing, we can create an image like this. A larger light like this, which is 24 by 32 inches, is going to give us better overall light coverage over our subject and allow us to kind of paint that light in top to bottom like you see. And it gives us really great quality of light too because our light source is bigger. Absolutely. It can also help us to take situations like this where maybe we have some interesting light in the background but the light on the front, and in this case these are some guys, some grooms when we shot in a tunnel, the light in the, in the front of the shot is nothing, it's just a silhouette. But we can take that one off camera light if we have enough power and we can create these kind of images that you see right here. This is what one light with the right kind of modifier can do. Here's another few examples of using a more powerful light source. Here we are in blaring back sun in uh, the desert in Vegas shooting and if we expose for her face again we see that blown out sky. So what we can do is we can adjust our camera 
so that we get a nice detail on the background, but then of course we get this really bad light on our subject. So what we're doing now in this shot that you see is we're exposing our camera for the background, but now she's dark. Correct, and, that, and now what we could do is we simply add that light into the foreground, and one more powerful off-camera light can create these kind of beautiful, stunning images, believe it or not, in just 30 seconds or less. So that's kind of option one, so that's, that's what we want to talk about first, is what's the right kind of light. Here's the other option. We go from the big lights down to the smaller light sources. So this here is... So a high-powered light now to exactly. lights without as much power. Yeah, and for some of you, this kind of light that we're going to talk about next might be the right type of light for you. It's much smaller, it's easy to carry around, and it can also still produce some really stellar light. The only trade-off here is, one, it's less expensive. You're going to use this with an, uh, a light that you probably already have, which is a speed light. And most of you guys have a Canon speed light or a Nikon speed light. But the trade-off here is power. You don't have a lot of power. It's hard to walk out in broad daylight and overpower the sun, but you can do some really amazing portraits and shoot some really amazing reception lighting, dancing, and detail shots that are really stellar and absolutely beautiful and amazing with this sort of light. So we're going to walk you guys through here in a second showing you shooting a portrait with this. So what we want to show you guys is we were photographing a wedding. This is back in 2013. And the bride and groom said, hey, we're going to have our first dance outdoors on this wooden plank with no lighting at sunset. And at first that sounds cool because sunset is, you know, beautiful light that time of day. But of course, what happens at every wedding? It runs behind. It runs behind. So we're going, oh boy, look at this lighting. The light that you see on this couple right here is a little bit of a video light from the video guy. And it's coming in from underneath. We call that the scary movie lighting. And it's orange colored. So we got like this orange color on their face and then this beautiful sky in the background and it's terrible it wasn't working so here's what we did I knew this was cut happening because the day was running late so we went and got our speed light and the rapid box and because it's lower lighting we don't need a ton of power so we can use this the rapid box in our speed lights so I set up one speed light as our main light in the front and then because I've been doing this a long time I was able to set up two background lights which is very easy to do we won't talk about that today but it's very easy to do once you learn how to master that front light and then as the couple was dancing, we went from that terrible shot you saw earlier, which is this one, to moving into this right here. And this ends up being the final image for the client. And it works. It's beautiful. We have this really beautiful painted on light on the front of them, some great kicker light, and then that beautiful subdued sky in the background. All right, so we got a question. So let's go ahead and take that. Yeah, so uh, one question that's trending right now from a lot of people is you're showing us a lot of examples of light that um, that was used uh, that was that was used off camera. You know, these are all yes. lights that were off camera. Now, is it more for for the images we've been looking at? Everyone's really excited about all these images. Is it more the fact that it's off camera, or is it more the fact that it's not a you know a, a speed light type flash? Which is more the factor here? If you if you could rank which one's more the factor, the off camera aspect or kind of the power aspect, the ability to to tweak something beyond just a typical kind of simple speed light flash? It's definitely two things. So the first thing that's really important is the light, the quality of the light, which is the size of the light. Yeah, you can do some cool things off camera with your little speed light, but the problem is, is that light is so small. So, and we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to go a little bit deeper in a little bit later, but so the bigger the light source, even if you're using a low powered flash, you can still have the light source um, shoot through one of our diffusers and make it beautiful. So that is one part. Yeah, and really the biggest key is the ability to move that light not just off the camera, but just not coming directly from the camera. Yep. So it can be on your camera and you can swivel that speed light around and bounce it off a wall and get a very similar effect. But really the key to the three-dimensional look of the photos, the key to the bride or the groom looking their best, is the ability to position that light into a place that really brings out the best features in them. And we're going to talk about that coming up in step two and step three. But that is a great question. So yes, it's a combination of having the right quality of light, the right size of the light, and then the ability to move that light around or have it come in from a different direction than the camera's perspective. And Got this it. here is, yeah, this actually next slide of using some small lights is a great example of that. So here's some natural light. There's a huge window, and Jody and I were at this big um, uh, museum photographing uh, this wedding, and we saw this beautiful perspective. 
So we're looking down, we have these nice repeating patterns, and we're kind of peeking through into this area. And we thought, man, it'd be great to put the bride and groom in that first little opening right there to camera left. But the problem was all the light is coming from camera right to that position in camera left. So we know if we put the bride and groom there, we'll see all the light, and we won't see any of the shadow side of their face, so it'll end up looking very flat. So what we're able to do by moving the flash off of the camera and putting it onto the left side of the frame behind that wall that you can't see is we're able to do this. So now we have a highlight and contrast side, and we're able to put a light in the background to create a much more contrasty an interesting image that highlights the best of our client but also creates some highlight and shadow area. So yes, just to answer that question, those two images really show that there. So now, uh, before we move on, do we have another question? I just want to clarify, yeah. so the two main differences between those two lights is one has a lot of power and then the other option using speed lights does not have a lot of power. So if you're using your speed light as a beautiful light source shooting through you know, a great softbox, you are limited. You are limited to shooting in lower light situations. You won't be able to overpower the sun or shoot in broad daylight like mm -hmm. you would be able to with the high-powered strobe. But the great thing is both of them can produce beautiful light. Yep. Just some of them can't produce beautiful light in certain bright lighting conditions because yep. of their lack of power. All right. Another question? Well, uh, what, <laughs> uh, already probably a hundred questions, but <laughs> what we want to do is keep keep it going, and we'll definitely keep for all of you who are chatting in. Thank you so much. We got a ton of questions. We're gonna um, we're gonna make sure we drip these questions as Jack and Jody, and a lot of them are gonna get answered um, because I have seen uh, part of this presentation. And then what we're gonna do is we will have a Q and A session at the end. So I'll keep asking Sweet. some questions that are kind of general, and we will make sure we spend a lot of time at the end asking some more. So go, keep going, guys. Go for it. Sounds excellent, great. excellent. So. Key one, remember, that key one is to find the right type of light that works for you. It may be lightweight, you, you may not, you may want a little more power, a little less power, it just depends on your style. The key number two is the right ratios of light. And now this is a section, this is the next piece of the puzzle when you start talking about ratios. And once you understand how these work, this helps you again to define your style. It's not right or wrong here. This is what do I like and what don't I like. Have you ever put your flash on your camera and you're shooting at a reception and your subjects are lit, but the background is completely black. When we talk about lighting ratios, we're talking about the balance between the light on your subject compared to the background and balancing those so it looks really great. So we're going to show you guys a few examples of some different ratios, and then we're going to actually talk in key three about exactly how to make sure all of this comes together in one cohesive system. So here we see sort of what we call a three to one lighting ratio. And we're not going to get into all the science of that. You don't need to worry about that. But what you need to know is what, what does it look like and what do I prefer? This is where the light on their faces from our flash, which you can see is coming in, is similar in brightness to the rest of the light in the shot or the light in the background. So it's a much more natural looking uh, lighting ratio. So the background isn't really dark. It isn't super moody. Everything sort of feels a little more light and airy. And that's what we call a three to one lighting ratio, which just simply means there's about as much light on our subject as there is in the background. If we then start moving into darker ratios, which are called five to one and nine to one, and we'll get into the, the science of that coming up, you start to get sort of these effects where we have this beautiful light on our subject, but now we start seeing this sky almost looks a little fake. Looks like somebody added it in. Same thing with this image. He really pops out of the background, has a lot of contrast on his body, and the sky starts to turn colors that you normally wouldn't see in a correct exposure. They start to look milky or uh, navy blue and darker sort of colors. And then the last one, and these are all styles that you can choose to do depending on what how you want to shoot, is sort of this look. We can get this ultra moody, really uh, low key, they call it, style of shooting where we have this bright light on our subject, but then this very dark and kind of mysterious looking background. I personally like all of these, but you need to determine what style you prefer to shoot in, and then you can adjust that by deciding what ratio works best for you. And what's cool about having, you know, this lighting skill is this shot was actually taken at the golden hour in the summertime in Florida. And you would have no idea that the natural bright. light, if you took an ambient lit <laughs> shot, it was beautiful natural light. We took tons of photos in that natural light, but we also wanted to add this drama. And by um, shooting with such a higher ratio, it looks really cool and dramatic. And we're able to give our couples these complete different looks in the same setup, which is really fun. Yeah, so for the last, you know, 30 minutes that we've all been talking together, we've been talking about 
a lot of theoretical things. We've been showing you pretty pictures and you're going, how in the world do I do this? That's the big question. And we are going to leave no stone unturned, as we like to say. So key three, as we can in 45, minutes. Can in 45 <laughs> minutes. So key three is really going to bring all of this together for you guys. We talked about getting the right type of light with the right power and the right size of light modifier. We talked about ratios and how they look. But now we want to talk about really the most important thing, and that is the correct system. And this is something I've been talking about for many years. I used to be a musician. That was my first passion. Um, I was a professional touring musician. And one of the things that draw me to music was the fact that music is very scientific. There's a mathematical calculation to music, but it's also highly creative. And when you mix the two of them together, when you have a great working foundation of science, and then you start mixing in your personal creativity, that's when the magic happens. So what Jody and I are gonna talk about with the system is what is a foundational way to do off-camera lighting that's going to give you guys a powerful foundation that you can then build your creativity on top of. So there are a couple keys within the keys of using an off-camera light, and we wanna use it, we wanna talk about these keys with this image. And this is the final shot, but we will show you the shots taken leading up to this of how just even light placement and the quality can make a huge difference on your shot. So the very first um, thing that we're looking for when it comes to light is quality. So when we talk about quality of light, we talk about a lot of things. There can be, as many of you know, you can kind of go out um, uh, in the middle of the day and it's high noon and the sun is beating down right on your head and you take a photo of your client looking at you and you got this bright light on the top of their head and these really dark raccoon eyes. Now, as far as quality goes, we would call that lower quality light or very harsh light. It's very hard to deal with because it's contrasty, it's very specular. Digital photography, if that light isn't in the perfect position, it's really hard to deal with. So when we talk about quality of light, we talk about when that light comes out and hits our subject, what does it do to them? And for us, good quality light tends to be softer, easier to manage light. So first off, we want to have good quality light. We showed earlier having a nice soft box that enhances the size of the light is going to give us that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. But step number one is we want to have good quality light to begin with. And once we have that, then we can move on to the next step, which is the positioning or the height of that light. So a lot of times people get caught up here and they're not sure exactly where to place that light. So, you know, you take a flashlight at a campfire and what do you do? You stick it under your chin and you look like you're in a scary movie, right? And that's <laughs> fun for those situations, but that is not the look that we want to give to our clients for the most part. So we want to move that light up in a beautiful position that won't give us weird shadows or awkward mustache shadows from our nose because the light's too high. We want to put the light in the height that is very complementary to our subjects and creates highlights and shadows. So this is where we want to place our light. Yeah, so a great rule of thumb, and there's many different variations of this, but if you're getting a, a, a strobe, uh, an off-camera light, a speed light off-camera, or even a, a, a flash on your camera that you're bouncing off of a wall, the positioning that we want that light to come to our clients is very simple. Wherever the center of the light source is, so if you're bouncing the light off the wall, that's where it's bouncing off the wall. If it's an off-camera uh, speed light through a rapid box that we showed earlier, it's the center of that speed light. Or if it's that big soft box, it's the center of that soft box. Wherever the center of that light source is, we want that to be a little bit above the center of the eyes. And something magical happens when you do that. When you move it above the center of the eyes, the shadows fall down the face in a classic portraiture position where we get a shadow that goes about halfway between the mouth and the, lip, and the, and the nose, so right in the middle of the lip. And that's really the perfect positioning. So the easiest way to do that is simply stand behind your light and raise it up until you're looking underneath the light at about your client's chin. Once you do that, all of a sudden that light will be in the perfect position or just stand where your client will stand and look at that light and make sure it's slightly above the center of the eyes. Even when you guys first started this webinar, you saw Jody and I sitting here. We actually have an, a constant light in front of us and it's above us, the center of it is slightly above the center of our eyes. So that is a perfect generic rule of thumb to get you started. The last thing, so we've got the quality, we've got the height, and now the last thing is the direction of that light. This is where, you know, the question about is it taking your flash off camera, is that the trick? So if you have your flash on camera and you're pointing it directly at your subject, the direction that you are pointing this to your subject is straight on. 
and this is a, it creates a very paparazzi look. The problem with this direction of light is that it creates no dimension. It's very flat. We like to move our lights off camera or have the light, you know, maybe bouncing off a wall and coming at our subject from a different direction so we can get this highlight and shadows which creates dimension to our client. And another great thing that it does is it can hide some features that are falling in the shadows that we maybe necessarily don't want to highlight. Yeah, so believe it or not, we could talk about just these three simple things or even just the direction of the light for 30 or 40 minutes straight. So we're going to show you guys one real life example of a series of photos where the quality, height, and direction all came together and made for a really beautiful image. A beautiful image. So this is image number one. My wife was photographing this wedding. This is a few years ago and we had a constant light source. This was a big beautiful window that was about four feet by six feet in size and it was shining down onto this staircase. And you ever notice when light comes through a window, it sort of arcs at a 45 degree angle. Light does that out of a soft box. It does that off of a speed light. It comes down at us at this angle. And what we want to do is we want to get everything together, those three keys, the, the quality, the height, and the direction together. And once they come together, you're going to see in a second how it becomes magic. So with this first image, you notice that lighting pattern coming from camera left at a 45 degree angle, the light's coming down. But notice where the center of all that light is. It's right around her knee area. So even though we have beautiful quality light, meaning it's very even and it's very soft. and It's, it's a, a big light source and it's yeah, indirect light, so indirect, it's very soft. Very soft. It's hitting her in the knee, so the light on her arm there and her face does not look good. This is not flattering at all. In image number two, she's a little bit further down the steps, and now that light is hitting her kind of in the stomach, chest area. It doesn't look that great yet, but it is. You can see how soft it is, and we've got some nice highlight and shadows uh, from the left side to the right side of her body. But it's still not quite in the perfect position. But now the last thing that needs to come together, we have the height of the light is almost there. We have great quality. The height is almost there. And then the last two, uh, two that height and the, and the direction, are going to come together in this very final image. So take a look at this. All of these images are the same editing, the same bride, the same everything. But all of a sudden, when she steps into that light, now notice the center of the light source is slightly above the center of the eyes. You can actually see, if you look real close, that there's a catch light in her eyes that's just above the pupil. Another couple of great things are happening, and that's what's called, if you look at her face, you'll notice the on camera left or the right side of her face is most of the light is hitting her. And then on the left side of her face or on camera right, we have this beautiful shadow. When that happens, when your client's face is slightly away from you and the light is lighting what's called the shorter side of the face or the face furthest away from the camera, it's called short lighting. And all of a sudden, her body gets trimmer, her face gets slim, we get this beautiful contrast, and everything starts to come together, and that's one of the best lighting patterns. If there was one lighting pattern we would teach anybody, it's to shoot with the light wrapping around that further side of the face and creating a shadow on the closer side of the face. And here you have it. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. If we have any questions on that, I'm sure there's some coming in. But this is really very, very beautiful way to shoot images of your clients. So even though that, that was a natural lit shot, this is a, what we're doing. We're doing the same thing when we set up our own light as we're setting it up at a certain height or making sure that the light source itself is big and beautiful and not coming from a little small light source and then we're making sure that it's flattering our subject that creates great highlights and shadows. So now we're gonna in these this next slide right here we're gonna have a few steps if you guys are taking notes or you're taking images of the screen so we talked about that practicality of the height um, positioning of the light just now and the quality of the light now this is the system that Jody and I walked through. This is it. This is the bread and butter. This is the, the whole kit and caboodle right here. So watch this system unfold and you're going to see exactly how we create off-camera lighting images every single time with consistency. So step number one is we pick that lighting pattern. Where off-camera do we want that flash to come in and hit our client? Do we want it to hit on the left side of the face so we create some contrast? Do we want it to be just over the shoulder to create more of that short lighting pattern? Where do we want that light? And that when we pick the lighting pattern, that includes the height of the light and that direction that, that we just talked about, where the light is coming in. And the next thing we do is we actually set up our strobe. You yeah. know, make sure that the light is set up 
um, to shoot and shine on our subject and the great pattern that we want, and then that the height is correct as well. Remember, the center of that light source would be above the center of the eyes. So if your client is shorter, it's going to come down a bit. If your client's taller, it's going to go up a bit. If you have a bride who's short and a groom who's really tall, split the difference. Put it in between the two of them as far as height goes so you can get the best of both worlds. The next step. This is for when we're outside and we have a lot of natural light to deal with. If we're in darker situations, this would be changed, but this is a gen general rule of thumb. We're going to set the meter uh, ISO to 1 100th of a second. We're going to show you guys, but we use a uh, handheld light meter, and the reason that we do that is because there's a meter inside your camera, but that meter cannot read off-camera flash when you move it off-camera, unless you're using a few sophisticated systems, which we're not going to talk about. So we always use a handheld light meter because it allows us to work very quickly and gets us very consistent results all the time. And light meters can seem really intimidating, um, but they're actually not. They're actually very simple to use. And like Zach mentioned, having a light meter takes the guesswork out. As you know, sometimes when you're shooting weddings or even portraits, you know, you have a very limited amount of time and you can't spend a half hour trying to guess the lighting. You need to know. And so having a light meter helps take that guesswork away. And all the light meter really is, is it's a way to set the same things your camera sets, which is ISO, shutter speed and f-stop except it can pick a variable for you so if you set the ISO on the shutter speed you take a reading it tells you how bright the light is with an f-stop it's a very powerful tool so step number one or step number three there is we set the ISO on our meter to 100 or ISO 100 the next thing we do is we set the shutter speed on our meter to 1 100th of a second and the reason we do that is because of something called the x sync speed have you ever been um, shooting uh, with your camera and your flash and you take a shot at a reception, for example, and you see black lines at the top and the bottom of your image and you're like, what in the world is happening? What's happening is your shutter is going so fast that it can't catch all the light coming from the flash. So simply what your X sync speed is, is it varies from camera to camera. Canon is about 1 200th of a second. It's telling you, hey, if you shoot over this X sync speed, in Canon, one two hundredth of a second, like I um, had mentioned, then um, then you may start missing some of the flash, and you may get those black lines at the bottom. So it's just the safety zone that you want to stay way under. So we're actually setting our uh, shutter speed to about half of the X sync speed for a specific reason, which we'll show you right at the end of this little slide. But we set that. It's very simple. ISO to one hundred, shutter speed to one hundred. And then we take a meter reading, and there you can see the meter that we use, which is the Siconic L358 if you're taking notes. So we set those two variables, then we step in front of the flash, we put the flash right on our chin or on our client's chin. I prefer to use mine before the client even gets there, so I'm not putting a meter by their face. And I take a reading of that flash going, that's hitting that little white bulb right there on the light meter. Once that happens, this is where some magic happens that a lot of people don't talk about and don't share. We now need to decipher what ratio we need. Remember we talked about the look of your photo is going to depend on how bright your flash is compared to that light in the background. So when you take a meter reading on the Siconic L358, not every light meter does this, this really amazing thing pops up called the percentage. And what the percentage is doing is it's really quickly reading the ambient light, and then it's reading the flash, and then it's giving you the ratio between the two of those. So what's really powerful about this is if your ratio on there, if the percentage says 60% and you take a photo at whatever setting 60% is, you're going to get a very natural looking shot where your flash will be just a little bit brighter than the background. If you go to 70%, the background will be a little bit darker. If you go to 80%, the background will become much more dramatic. If you go to 90%, it becomes extremely dramatic. And what it's saying, like if you're at 90%, it's saying the majority of the light that you're seeing is coming from the flash. Yep, 90% is flash, 10% is ambient, or 60% is flash, and 40% is ambient. This is such a powerful tool because Jody and I, as we go out and practice, we start going, man, I love the 70% look. When I get to 70%, I love that look. And then you can go out and you just power your strobe up or down until you get to the percentage you want. You set your camera to those settings and you start taking images. You set your camera to the settings that the meter is telling you. Yep. And then you start taking photos and all of a sudden your images look amazingly awesome. So like we mentioned, we just power that strobe up or down until you get to 70% or whatever desired ratio that you start to like as you start practicing this. And then all of a sudden your flash... Um, images start looking amazing. So you just simply set your camera to those settings, the ISO, the shutter speed, and the f-stop, 
and you start taking photos. It's really that simple. Now, of course, there's many variables. Sometimes there can be reasons why this won't work, but about 70 or 80% of the time this works perfectly well for most lighting situations. And the reasons why it wouldn't work would be is just you're in a different lighting situation, not that your camera's going funky or your meter's going wrong. Like this is a system that actually works. Yay. So here's what's really cool. Remember earlier in step uh, three or step four of this part, we said set your sh meter shutter speed to one one hundredth of a second, which is about half of how fast it can go before it can't see the flash correctly. The reason we do that is because of this very last step, which is adjust your shutter speed to ratio preference. So what's cool is, say you set it all up and you dial it up and it gets to 70%, you pull back and you take a photo, and then you realize, man, I wish the background was a little bit darker. If you had your shutter speed set to its max speed, 200 or 250, depending on the camera you use, you'd have to go back to your meter, go back to your flash, and start adjusting the settings. Well, now, because we have set our uh, shutter speed to half the sync speed, we can do something really powerful that a lot of people that haven't used flash a lot don't realize you can do, and it's adjust our shutter speed to ratio, ratio preference. The reason you can do that is because your camera's ability to see a flash uh, shot is determined by your ISO and by your f-stop and not by your shutter speed. Your shutter speed does not affect the brightness of the flash, and we're going to show you exactly what we mean. So all three of these images we're about to show you are shot at ISO 50, at f4.5, and all we did was adjust the shutter speed, and watch what happens. So this first shot here, it was taken at 1 60th of a second. So you can see that you know you have a good balance of ambient light and strobe. And yes, then... and notice she's just a little bit brighter than that background. She has some nice contrast on her face, and it's a very pleasing overall image. And when we set this up on the meter, this said we were at about 60% when we started at these specific settings. Then for the next shot, we simply didn't change anything but our shutter speed. We sped it up to 1 100th of a second, and notice there's a little more contrast on her face and body, and there's a darker background. We can completely change the look of the image simply by slowing down or speeding up our shutter speed. And then here in the last photo, even though her face appears darker, if you look at the highlight side of her face, it's the same brightness. We just have deeper, darker shadows where the flash isn't hitting her and where the ambient is getting darker. And then the sky is starting to get moodier and moodier and moodier. Yeah. And as a reminder, just everybody, we have a we have a note posted in the chats that you can uh, go and grab the uh, uh, the ebook, which also yes. has a lot of this information in yep. an ebook fashion. So to go grab that ebook, it's a free download. It is available. We have it posted in the chat room. Yeah. So moving forward, just to show you guys a few more examples, um, here you can see us kind of using that system that we just talked about. We uh, our client here in Vegas is in the shade, and then we have that really bright background. What we wanted was a darker background so we could see more of the details and the the contrast in those mountains back there. So in the next photograph, we simply adjusted our camera until we got the background to look the way that we wanted it to. We then turned on our strobe powered it up until our histogram got brighter and brighter. We use the light meter for our shot, but you could do it the way we just talked about. And then once we got the, uh, the strobe bright enough to where we got a correct exposure on the skin, now here's the two of them combined. That darkened background, we have a larger strobe, so we have a lot of light on our whole body, and we get a really beautiful looking image. Here's a couple other um, images that we're going to show you of what you can do. Same thing here where um, we're, in this case, we continue to slow our shutter speed down, slower and slower until we get nice ambient light. Some people get scared when they slow their shutter speed down. But remember, if you're using flash, you can actually freeze action and freeze images at a lot lower shutter speeds than you're used to shooting at. Um, you can also, you know shoot a couple in the direction of the light. So what you want to be careful of is, you know, when you have a uh, bride and groom or a fiancé, whatever, and they're the same height, and you're putting the light to off camera to, you know, for this example, it's camera right. If our girl was as high as the guy, then she would be casting a shadow across his face. So it helps in this case that she is a little bit shorter, but we also turn them and have her step back just slightly so she doesn't cast a shadow over his face. And there's so many other amazing things you can do. You can create high drama with the sun shooting right into the camera, but then still get beautiful light on your client. You can use it in conjunction with other lights. You, here, in this case, using the sun, which is that light lighting up her hair in the background as a kicker light, we call it, so we get some really great separation from the background. 
We can also shoot in locations that normally you would be, not be able to get a, an amazingly cool photo because all the drama was in that darkness of the sky. And if we exposed for that, we would have had a really dark uh, couple up there on the mountain. You can also shoot some really amazing reception stuff using these techniques just by using a bounce flash. You can bounce, you know, underexpose the light in the room just a teeny bit, and then you bounce your flash in at the nice direction that flatters your client to get really beautiful images. And then the last image that we'll show you guys before we start taking some more questions is you can use this. Uh, you know, that rapid box with a speed light to create really stunning and beautiful detail shots for all of your reception work that you may do. So Jared mentioned it a few times, uh, but don't forget we have even more information in our off-camera uh, quick start guide that anybody can get um, from just going to that link that you've seen, which is ZJ sign up, that bit.ly link. And all and you have to do is just confirm your subscription and confirm your email, and then that download email will be sent to you where you can download the book.